Today we're talking about the deadliest catch. We're on a series. Last week we talked about when you just didn't have enough. Guess what? Today we're going to continue that thought. Uh, it's, it's a three-part series. This is the second installment of that series. Uh, so turn with me in your Bible to John chapter 6. We're going to be looking at really the first 11, 12 verses. Uh, but if you would join with me, we're going to be looking at verse 1. And it says this, Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, and that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. And when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him. Say test him. We're going to look at that word in a minute. For he already had in mind what he was going to do. Verse 7 says, Philip answered him, eight months wages, Lord, would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Verse 8 says, another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And I pray that today, Lord, this Sunday before Thanksgiving, that, Lord, you would encourage us with your word. Father, there may be many here that just seems like there's not enough. Lord, you're our provider. Lord, help us to look to you. Father, we give you praise for, for all that you do for us. Lord, you're the best. You are just so awesome, and you have been good to us. And, Lord, we pause just to give you praise right now, to thank you for your goodness. Lord, we give you praise. Honor your servant today, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. So today we're looking at the idea in this series of what do you do when, you know, the catch isn't enough to feed the family? What happens when the bills are more than the paycheck is able to pay? What do you do when there's just not enough? You, that is the deadliest catch. It's not the hazardous conditions. I, I know men that will, will venture into hazardous, dangerous conditions if they can get the right catch, can feed their family, that can put food on the table. But what happens when you do all that you can do and you still come up empty. Well, that's what we're going to look at this morning in this series. And we're going to look at this miracle of the loaves and fishes. Many of us are familiar with this. You learned this back in Sunday school. It's an important word for us today, the feeding of 5,000. Now, the Lord has three important lessons that he wants us to grasp from this passage of Scripture. In fact, he alludes to it in, in verses 5 and 6. Look with me again in verses 5 and 6 of John chapter 6. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And he asked this only, now listen to this, to test him. Okay? This is an important test. He's wanting to present a lesson to teach a lesson to these disciples. Not only are the disciples going to see one of the most memorable miracles of their lives, they're also going to experience and learn one of the greatest lessons that someone can learn. And we see this in verse 8. He asked this only to test him, for he, had, for he already had in mind, Jesus already had in mind what he was going to do. Now, it's clear Jesus is wanting to teach the disciples, but he's also wanting to teach us something very important today. And I want you to stay in tune. Stay with me. We're, I'm going to 
not going to, I'm not going to preach an hour and 25 minutes. I, I don't have the wrong dentures in. So we're going to keep this concise and right to the point. Okay. But it's very clear. Now, the Bible says, I want you to take note of verse 10 if you're looking at this in your Bibles. Uh, it says 5,000 men. So the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. In that particular season of history, they counted just the men. So there were more than 5,000 because the women and children were also along. In fact, theologians estimate somewhere between 10 and 15,000 people uh, more than likely were there, but there were 5,000 men that were present for sure. And, and so we get a sea of humanity, if you can picture this, by the Sea of Galilee. It's, it's like, I mean, think about it, 10 to 15,000 people. That could fill a small stadium. I mean, many of you watch football. I, I need to do a shout out for my son-in-law, LSU Juan, yesterday. He is like an LSU fanatic. I've never seen anybody like that. I mean, he's got LSU everything, Tigers. He's, and that's okay, except when they play Mississippi State. And then we kind of root against each other. And uh, I don't want to remind him that Mississippi State beat LSU this particular year. But uh, anyway, you could fill a small stadium. And if you can picture that, I mean, it's getting toward the late in the afternoon. It's getting late. Uh, the people are hungry. And I can just picture the disciples. They're having this little on the side conversation while Jesus is talking and teaching. They're like, you know. Does Jesus know what time it is? Is he aware of how late it is? These people are hungry. Some of them have to travel great distances. You know, they need something to eat. They need energy. And, and why? I can just picture they're having this off-to-the-side conversation. Jesus says, Philip. Yes, Master? Philip. Where are we going to get? Where are we going to find enough bread? Say enough. Enough bread to feed all of these people. That's where, that's where a lot of us live. Or it just seems like we don't have enough. Got a bill to pay. It just seems like I just don't have enough this week or, or this month. And, and we tend to worry. We tend to stress over the issues, whatever it may be, whether it's finances, whether it's, it's food, whether it's being able to care for your family effectively or, or not. And, and here, Philip's saying, where are we going to, Jesus says to Philip, where are we going to find enough bread to feed all of these people? And in other words, I mean, this large crowd, where are we going to find a couple of semi-trucks loaded with food to feed this large crowd? And so in this miracle, that Jesus performs the feeding of 5,000 plus, if I can say it that way. There are three lessons that I want to bring your attention to. Three lessons of the miracle of the fish and loaves. Number one, the measuring stick lesson. Now, this is very important. The measuring stick lesson. Do not measure a problem or challenge according to your own ability or resources Seeing it's impossible. That's how we approach things. We, we try to frame whatever issue it is by our ability, our resources, our initiative to solve the problem. And here's Philip. Bless his heart. He looks at this and the Lord is just saying, where are we going to find enough food to feed this stadium of people, the sea of humanity. And immediately, Philip draws back. You know, I, the closer you get to the problem, the bigger the problem seems. And, and the bigger the problem seems, the more overwhelmed we become. And the more overwhelmed we become, the more impossible it seems that we'd be able to address the problem. Listen, it doesn't have to be 15,000 people. 
If you have a, a bill that's $300 and you only have $30 in your bank account, it, that seems like a million bucks. You know, when you don't have it, you don't have it. When there's not enough, it's not enough. My mom and dad used to say all the time, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. And I'm so grateful they were great at budgeting their resources. But many times we act like Philip and, and panic. Notice what Philip says in verse 7. He says, Lord, eight months wages. Now think about that. Take eight months of your salary and say, you know, that wouldn't cover it. We're not buy enough bread for each one to have a single bite. Hmm. In other words, eight months wages won't even give them a snack. Wow. I remember a missionary. I went to El Salvador several times, learned a little bit of Spanish. I, I remember greeting a little eight-year-old one morning, and, and I said, Wienish noches. And, and the little guy just started laughing and just, just going crazy laughing. I'm like, what did I say? He said, you said good night. Oh. oh. And so I tried some Spanish. It didn't quite work. But needless to say, as I was with him on, on several tours down in El Salvador, which, by the way, just got hit by a Category 5 hurricane, we need to pray for that nation as well as Honduras and that Central American window there. And I just saw a sea of humanity. We would sing and he would get up and share and we would see literally thousands of kids, adults. Because when you start playing music in Central America, I mean, they come out of everywhere. And we had our uh, Evangel University group with brass and uh, drums. And I tell you what, the people in Central America love music. I mean, they love it almost as much as you love music, I tell you. And so they just came from everywhere. And I, I remember we were driving, and I asked Don Triplett, the missionary, an important question. I said, I mean, look at all the people. How do you think you'll be able to make a difference? It just seems like there are just so many people. The need is so great. In fact, there were some real small kids that were running around with no clothes on. I said, why, why don't they have clothes on? And Don said, because the moms have taken the clothes off to wash them so they'll have clothes to wear for school the next day. Well, we can't even relate to that, can we? we you know, our kids are blessed. Our children are blessed. And here's an impoverished nation. I'm so grateful. Don Triplett is, and his team is one of the missionaries that we support regularly. And, and uh, I just asked him the question, how will you be able to meet the need with so many here? And here's what he said. I, I'll always remember this. He said, we have to believe that Jesus is enough. That Jesus is enough. When someone invites Jesus Christ into their life, when they make Jesus their Lord and Savior, the Bible tells us that they become candidates for the promises of God. The Bible says that my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That means that Jesus is enough. If you'll put your faith and trust in him, it doesn't matter if you're in America or El Salvador, God will take care of you. It may look like it's an impossibility. It may look like an impoverished uh, setup, but I'm telling you, with your faith and trust in God, he'll make it happen. With men, it's impossible. But the Bible says with God, all things are possible. See, Jesus loves impossible situations. You know, he doesn't fall off his throne when challenging circumstances arise. He doesn't bite his fingernails. He's not pacing the floor at night wondering, like, what am I going to 
do with this situation? How am I going to take care of my people that trust in me? No, he, the Bible tells us that he meets all of our need. My God shall supply what? All of our need according to his riches and glory. Here's the problem. We don't believe that. Oh, maybe with our lips we say that, but do we really believe that he will is enough? And I think that's what stood out to me with missionary Don Triplett. He said, we have to believe. I'm here. I've, I've given my life to El Salvador to proclaim that Jesus is enough. And he's turned with the Castillo del Rey ministry, he's turned that nation upside down for Jesus Christ, reaching kids and young people. And I'm so grateful to be a, a part of that ministry. And you're part of that ministry when you support missions. But you know, the, uh, the omnipotent, the word omnipotent and impossible really shouldn't be in the same dictionary because God specializes in doing things that seem impossible. I mean, the virgin birth. Oh, that's pretty impossible. I mean, healing a woman who had been sick for 12 years, and she had tried many physicians but only grew, grew worth. And when she touched the hem of the garment, something that was impossible for man became possible with God. When Jesus came upon the the paralytic at, at the pool of Siloam. He said, take up your bed and walk. Wow. That seems pretty impossible. Uh, when he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, when he raised the son of the woman at Nain's son from the dead, when he said to Lazarus, come forth and raise Lazarus from the dead, I, I would say that that's in the impossible category. Hello? You guys with me today? I hope you're catching this. Because when you're at a place when you just don't have enough, when you just don't have enough emotional energy, or if you don't have enough resource, whatever it may be, Jesus is enough. In fact, the New Living Translation in verse 7 says, It would take a small fortune, Lord. A small fortune to feed them. We don't have that. It would take a small fortune. And some of you may be in a situation where it just seems impossible, whether it's in your family or your business or, or your personal life. You're at a roadblock. You're overwhelmed. It looks like a closed door. You're at a dead end. And it seems like it would take a small fortune to fix that problem. And you feel a lot like Philip. Lord, you, you want me to, let me get this right. You, you want me to do what? You want me to see how we can feed these, these? Have you seen how many people are out there? And Jesus already knew what he was going to do. He said this to test him. Every, listen, every day of your life, you have an opportunity to make a decision, am I going to trust the Lord today or not? Yeah, I, my, my bills and my bank account may not match, but guess what? God is greater. God's going to provide for me. Jesus is enough. So when it seems impossible, you're in a situation. You know, it's not the things that sometimes we get our little things that we get our Selves into God takes care of those, but a lot of times it's those things that you confront that are out of your control. Those things, it doesn't matter what you try to do or what you try to accomplish, it's beyond your ability to repair or fix. So, why does God allow it to happen in your life? Well, let me give you two reasons. God often takes us through a process, and here are two reasons. Number one, it's for you. It's for us. You know, God forges character in our lives by allowing us to go through life's trials. Look at this verse in, in uh, reading from the James, um, the King James Version, James chapter one, verse three says, knowing this, that the trying of your what? Faith worketh patience. 
Sometimes we go through stuff in our lives because God is wanting to build character. God wants you to become a mature individual that is Christ-like, that exhibits a reflection of him. You know, that's what the Bible says, that we might be conformed to the image of his son. That, what that is saying is the Lord is working on all of us. He's not finished with any of us. He's working. And a lot of, I see many of you growing and maturing and becoming more like Christ. You're becoming conformed to his image. And sometimes we go through trials and challenges because God wants to help us. It's through the crucible of life that we build character. You see, God puts us in impossible situations to stretch our faith. He puts us in impossible situations to help us to focus on our eternal hope. God puts us in challenging situations to show us his incredible love. You know, God is able, more than able. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. And he loves you. He is greater than your circumstance or problem. Or when you feel like there's just not enough. Don't lose heart. Listen to me, church. Don't lose heart. Jesus is enough. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Put your hope in him. The second reason is for others. Not only for us, but God often takes us through a process for others. Many of you are the only Christ that people around you will see. Many of you are the only Bible that your friends, family, people around you will read. Look at what uh, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2. It says, you yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. Your life is like a letter. People are reading your mail. People are watching you. You've heard me say this before. You've got pairs of eyes that are focused on you and how you're going to walk through that challenge or that circumstance. Because the trial you're going through isn't so much for you as much as it for others. And when you take a stand for Christ and say, you know, I, I don't know doesn't mean you have to know everything or know how God's going to do this. But, but when you say, and I've heard people say this when I was a kid, you know, I, this certainly isn't what I would have picked, but God's in control. We're going to trust God. I wouldn't have chosen to go down this path, but, but we're going to trust God in this. And other pe people are watching. I'm even sharing this because I've seen the saints of God take a stand, even in trials, hard times, and say, we're going to trust. We're going to believe God. We're just going to, we're not going to give up. God will see us through. Through it all. Some of us remember that old Andre Kraut song, through, song, through it all. Through it all. I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. It's through those challenges that our faith is built. It's through those challenges and trial that people watch and see and are able to, to turn to Christ because you're the only Jesus. You're the only Bible they'll ever read. I love this, this verse in the message in 2 Corinthians 6, 4 through 10. It said, notice this. It says, our work as God's servants get validated in the details. People are watching us. As we stay at our post alertly, unswervingly, in hard times, tough times, bad times, when we're beaten up, jailed, and, and, and mobbed, working hard, working late, working without eating, with pure heart, clear head, steady hand, in gentleness, holiness, and honest love, when we're telling the truth and when God's showing his power, when we're doing our best, setting things right. When we're praised and when we're blamed, slandered and honored, true to our word, 
so distrusted, ignored by the world, but recognized by God, terrifically alive, though rumored to be dead, beaten within an inch of our lives, but refusing to die, immersed in tears, yet always filled with deep joy, living on handouts, yet enriched, enriching many, having nothing, having it all. In, in, boy, isn't that a powerful passage? That's a message. It's, it's not really a translation. It's a paraphrase. But uh, a theologian who wrote the message, uh, Peterson, John Peterson, I think is his first name, but I know the last name is Peterson, was just a tremendous theologian. Spent his life studying the word and and put together this message. Now listen, you're an open book. People are watching you. They're, they're reading what, how you respond. And the only way they'll see Christ is how you respond to the circumstances, the problems, and the struggles that, that you confront. You know, the point is this. They'll see a living God working in your life when you respond and put your trust and faith in him. Here's an opportunity for God to reveal himself to a lost world because they'll see the miracle done in your life. They'll see the resolution. It looked, from, from the world's perspective, there's no way out. It's impossible. It would take a miracle. And when God does a miracle, in your life, which he will do, if you will tr stay true and faithful and trust him, they will see that miracle happen in your life. Sometimes uh, God works things out relationally. I think we need to recognize sometimes it's not always logically. You, know, you don't always have a blueprint. There's not a formula that you have to do, you know. And that's what we often want. What's the formula? What do I have to do? What are the five steps that will bring victory or success? I want to know the formula. And sometimes God doesn't give us a formula. He works things in our lives relationally. But he does work ever, ever consistently. The second lesson that we learn is this. It's the scales lesson. Little in the hands of Jesus becomes much. Now, Philip, as we just talked about, had a problem. How are we going to feed all these people? Lord, have you seen how many? Now, Andrew, who happens to be Peter's brother, Andrew uh, has a similar problem. He's looking at it from a different angle. Notice uh, verse 8 and 9 of our text. Andrew spoke up. Here is a boy with five small fishes of loaves. Sm uh, I'm sorry, small loaves and two fish, two small fish. I want to get in there, that two small fish. I mean, if... If Andrew would have stopped right there, he would have been the hero of faith. Lord, hey, I've got the solution. Here are five, five loaves of bread, two fish. Lord, you bless it and you, you can do a miracle. I just trust you to do a miracle. But he didn't, if he would have just stopped right there, but he kept on speaking. Sometimes we get ourselves in trouble the same way. We don't stop, we just start looking at the negative. But how far will they go among so many? How are, how are these little tiny fish, sardines, and these barley loaves going to feed a small stadium of people? Hmm. You know, they had two perspectives, but the same wrong answer. Philip was, it's impossible. It'll take too much a small fortune. Andrew says, it's impossible. We have too little to meet the need. Two perspectives, 
Same wrong answer. But in the hands of Jesus, he can turn it around. Notice it would take too much. No. No need is too great for Christ. Or we have too little. Little in the hands of Christ will meet the need. And look at these two guys and the way they approach the problem. I see two life challenging questions. Here are the questions that we often confront in our lives. We're much like Philip, Andrew. I don't know, which one do you lean toward? I don't know, if this, is this like the half full or half empty question? Hello? Philip's question, what have I decided is too big for God to accomplish? In your life, what have you decided that's too big for God to accomplish? Yeah, Lord, I've seen you do miracles, but somehow we tend to put God in boxes. And oh, Lord, you, boy, you, you work in Pastor Dominique's life, but man, I, I'm just an average Christian. And we put God in a box like he only, that God is prejudiced. He only works in certain people's lives. What? That's not prejudice. It doesn't matter whether you're a pastor or a teacher or, or whether you just attend church regularly, just a Christian. These promises in God's word are for you. What have you decided that's too big for God? Andrew's question, what have I decided is too little to make a difference? I just don't have any resources. I don't have much talent. I, well, how can I make a difference? Or how can what I have help the situation? I've got too little. Can God use my little? I just have too little. Sometimes we find ourselves in one side of these perspectives. We often say there's not enough. Not enough money, not enough time, not enough energy. We've got this little sentence that we often put and we try to fill in the blank. Like, when I get more, then I'm going to, and we fill in the blank. When I get more time, then I'm going to do more ministry. When I get more energy, then I'm going to spend more time with my family. Uh, when I get more money, then I'm going to give like I've always wanted to give when I get more money. Uh, when I get more confidence, then I'm going to lead. I'm going to let God use me as a leader. Or when I get more experience, then I'm going to lead. So we, we always find ourselves, here's the problem. Here's a little secret about feeling like there's not enough. There's never enough. That feeling of there's never enough will keep you from accomplishing what God wants to do in your life. Because you're focused. You're like, you got blinders on the not enough instead of on God who's more than enough. Get your eyes off of, boy, how far will these go? How, how is this going to make a difference? You've got to look at God who's greater than your circumstance, who created heaven and earth. The same God who said that he will supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. The same God who is enough for whatever you're going through. Sometimes we need to step out in faith, right, Sam? We need to just take a step and trust God and watch what he does. There's something about a child of God saying, God, I don't see this. I don't have the resources. I don't know how it's going to work, but you've laid this on my, on my heart, and I'm just going to, in childlike faith, take a step. And when you take a step toward God, it touches his heart. All the resources of heaven will come into your life. Oh, we've been watching football, I, you know, the college ball, especially lately, LSU, Mississippi State. You know, if they're going to throw a pass, guys got to run down the field. 
He can't just stand there and let the quarterback throw it down the field. He's got to run the ball. He hasn't received the ball. He hasn't caught the ball. But at the right time with a good quarterback, and God's a great quarterback, that resource, that football will hit the spot. Sometimes you've got to take a step of faith. I don't see it yet. Look, the ball is in the air. It's coming. You have to trust God. And at the right moment, God's never late. He's never early, my mom used to say. He's right on time. Look at what the, the Bible says in, in verses 10 through 12. See, God is more than able to, to make up for any lack or ability or resources that you may have. Look at what it says. Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. And Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. That really stood out to me as I, this week. And distributed to those who were seated, this phrase, as much as they wanted. I've been around church a little. All right, here we're gonna we're gonna do portions. Make sure that we have enough to go around. None of that. No divine. No, just whatever you want. As much as you want. He did the same with the fish. I mean, here's the first fillet of fish sandwich. Right here, and when they had all had enough to eat. He said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left. And I want you to catch this. What an incredible miracle. They all uh, ate until they were full, as much as they wanted. And then he had them collect, and there were 12 baskets full. How many disciples were there? 12. Yeah, you're good students of the Word of God. Each disciple had a basket. What an illustrated sermon that God is enough, that God can meet your need. I'm almost done. Well, how does God make our little into much? Well, we see this throughout the Bible. We see this premise throughout the pages of Scripture. Look at uh, Judges chapter 7. We see this with Gideon. God tells Gideon. He's got... Tens of thousands of soldiers, but God says to Gideon, just like God is saying to you, look, I'll conquer the Midianites with these 300, the Lord told Gideon. Send all the others home. Are you kidding me? I think it was U.S. Grant that said, you've got to get there first with the most. If you're going to win a battle, God just kind of goes against conventional military strategy. You want me to send these tens of thousands of people home and you're, you're just going to use 300? Little is much in the hands of God. Uh, look at Goliath and David. We see in 1 Samuel 17, 50, it says this. So David defeated the Philistine with only a sling and a stone. He hit him and killed him. He did not even have a sword in his hand. What I think is God has a sense of humor. Here is this towering giant. He is, he is taunting God's people day after day after day. God's people are afraid. They're shivering in their armor. They are afraid of confronting this giant. What does God do? Send another giant? No. Sends a child. That, that even surprised Goliath. Am I a dog? Am I just a little dog? I mean, I can understand the child can kill a dog, but I'm not a, I'm a, I'm a big bad giant. Look at my spear. Look at my everything. You're sending a child out to confront me? Isn't that, God has an incredible sense of humor. A child defeats the biggest, baddest giant. 
Listen, there is no limitations on how God can work a miracle in your life if you'll trust him. God reduces our resources when God wants to do something great. Then God will magnify our need to let us see that, boy, this is going to take a miracle. Only God can do it. And then someone trusts God with the little that they have. And God uses the little to do a miracle. God loves that. God doesn't get glory if you have, you know, enormous resources or ability. And you just, well, they just have enormous resources. They didn't take any level of faith. Right, Hudson? You know, Hudson has enormous faith. He comes up to me every morning. Grandpa, I want to twink. Now, I want to twink now. I'm thirsty. It comes to me because I get up and guess what? Grandpa's going to the refrigerator and trying to get that little straw in the juice thing. And he's watching his cartoon. You know, we should have that childlike faith. God, I'm thirsty. In fact, he's our Abba Father. He can take care of whatever you're going through. Finally, we're going to close. And if Junil can come and start playing softly on the guitar. Uh, the ledger sheet lesson. Every encounter with a problem or challenge can increase or bring an increase. This is the El Shaddai moment. This is the God is more than enough. God is more than enough in your life. Whatever you're experiencing, whatever you're going through, whatever it seems like you have a lack in, God is more than enough. He's El Shaddai. Psalm 23, 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Put your trust in the shepherd. Put your trust in the one who will take care of every problem or situation. You see, when you need to feed 5,000 men plus women and children, and you only have five loaves of bread and two fishes, add Jesus to the equation and a miracle will happen and the men and women will be fed. Notice what it says in verse 12. When they had all, when they all had, excuse me, when they had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. Well, it's a good word right there. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. I, it's amazing to me. And when you look at the pages of Scripture, this just didn't happen one time. We have the feeding of the 4,000. We have other examples of, of the Lord doing something very similar time and time again again. When you put your trust in God, you'll be able to say, look what God did. I, I didn't know how it was going to happen. I didn't know how God was going to provide. I didn't know how God was going to heal that issue. I didn't know how God was going to heal that relationship. But I put Jesus and made him part of the equation. It's like we talked about last week when Jesus got in the boat with Peter, it made all the difference. Is Jesus in your boat today? Is he a part of whatever search, situation or circumstances you're confronting? Jesus will make the difference in your life. And you will be able to testify to those that are watching you. Look what God did. Look how God provided. Listen, you blessed the, the socks off me many times. You'll come up and say, Pastor, I just want to tell you what what the Lord did in my life. I want to tell you what the Lord did in my family. I want to tell you what God did. As a church, we should be experiencing those types of miracles on a regular basis as we put our trust in Him and not doubt, but allow God to work in the situations and circumstances that we confront. Amen? Amen. With every head bowed and every eye closed, 
Father, I thank you for your goodness. Lord, help us to remember that, Father, you are the difference maker. You're the way maker. Father, when it seems like we don't have enough, you're enough. Lord, help us to get our eyes off of the problem, off of the situation, off of what seems to be a lack. And Lord, help us to put our eyes on you, the author and finisher of our faith, our great shepherd who meets and provides for our every need. Father, thank you. You are a good, good God. and You minister to us often, daily. Lord, help us to come to the table Lord, and partake of that daily bread that you have provided for us daily. Hallelujah. With every head bowed and every eye closed, you're here today and you'd be honest and you'd, you'd say, Pastor, uh, there's a situation in my life or there's a circumstance or there's a physical need or there's a financial need, whatever it may be. And you'd be honest and you would say, Pastor, it just it seems like there's not enough. Or what I have is too little for God to use. Whatever it may be, a talent, whatever. If that's you, I'm not going to embarrass anyone, but I'm gonna, we're going to pray for you. I'm just going to ask you in faith to simply raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. Pray for me. Remember me in prayer. Yes, 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 yes. God sees his hands. Anyone else, that would be you. You just say, boy, it just seems like there's not enough. I need that miracle working hand of God. That you, yes, God sees that hand. Yes, God sees that hand. God is good. Amen. We always ask this, and it's really the most important part. If you're here today and you've never made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, and this morning, you'd like to, to invite Jesus Christ into your heart. I want you, with no one looking around, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand right up, right down, real quickly. Is there anyone? Anyone? God sees and God knows. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand with me this morning. There were many hands that were lifted this morning. Boy, I'm at a place, Pastor where it just seems like there's not enough, whatever the situation is, and many hands went up. We all find ourselves at some point in that situation. We need to look to God and watch what He does. Normally, I'd ask you to take the hand of the person next to you, but we're trying to practice safe distancing. So we're just going to pray right now. But would you do something with me? Would you look at the person on your right and on your left? And would you just pray for that person? Even if you don't know them, you may say, well, you know, I'm praying for the person in the, you know, the, the blue blouse or the white shirt or God knows. But many of us had our hands up. Many of us did. Would you partner with me in this pray that God's windows of heaven would just open up in a bountiful supply, whatever the need is, because Jesus is enough. He hasn't left you nor forsaken you. Don't judge your circumstances by what you see. Exhibit faith and put it in God. He's going to see you through. There's a miracle on its way. It's like that football in the air. You haven't caught it yet, but it's in the air. It's coming. You're going to receive a miracle. And I just sense, uh, and I, boy, you know, this has been a challenging year, but I've seen God move in so many ways in our congregation. I'm excited about what God has for the future for us. Amen. Let's pray. Pray for that person. Let's make it a concert of prayer. And I'm going to lead out and just pray for that person on your right and left. Father, we come before you. Lord, you are a good, good God. You're our shepherd. And Lord, sometimes we jump the gun and we judge uh, Lord, you, based on circumstances, Father, help us not to look at the circumstances. You're greater than the circumstances. Now, Lord, meet the need of each and every person. Lord, we pray for that person on our right. We pray for that person on our left. And, Father, we ask that you would just work a miracle.
Lord, pour out a blessing that no one can receive glory except you. And that we will hear the testimonies. Look what God did. Look how Jesus moved in this situation. Look how God healed this relationship. Look how God provided for that need. Father, we thank you, Lord, for providing for our every need. You're a good, good God. And Lord, we receive, Lord, your blessing today. Lord, I just pray and that, Lord, your favor would cover each and every person that's here and those that are watching online, that, Father, they would see the bountiful supply and favor of God in their lives and in their family. Lord, we're thankful for all the many things you do for us. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Elbow bump, 10 people, okay? Not too hard. Don't want, don't want to hit that funny bone. But elbow bump. Go in the power of our Lord and Savior. May His grace be with you. Amen.